Vodafone has been aggressively upgrading and rebuilding their sites in the region that myself and Jake live in. And we were fortunate enough to see and photograph extensively two of the 2100 MHz refarm upgrades taking place. In this video, I will show and discuss the various components like radio units, baseband and digital units inside the cabinets. But first, a very quick recap about the spectrum that Vodafone has and how the refarm process works. Vodafone has 2 by 17.4 MHz of 900 MHz spectrum, which is split into numerous non-contiguous chunks. Meanwhile, they have 2 by 14.8 MHz of 2100 MHz. On my diagrams, I'm only showing the downlink spectrum, not the uplink, because the UARFCNs and EARFCNs all refer to the downlink, so it makes it drive diagrammatically a lot simpler just to show the downlink spectrum. For the start of our spectrum refarming journey, we have the initial configuration. So Vodafone has one 3G carrier on 900 MHz, which is UARFCN 2938, and then it has two blocks of spectrum allocated to 2G operation. In the case of that 2100 MHz spectrum, that is used for three carriers of 3G with the UARFCNs of 10687, 10712 and 10736. The first step in the refarming process is to produce a second 3G carrier on the 900 MHz band. And to do this, some of the spectrum is cleared and then refarmed from 2G operation to 3G operation to produce the UARFCN of 2987. And as you can see from the lower down diagrams on this slide, the 3G2100 MHz remains the same typically in this stage of the process, not changing before the next step. Now that we have cleared and refarmed the 900 MHz spectrum to produce a second 3G carrier on the band, we can start the process of refarming 2100 MHz from 3G to 4G. Now this has three possible steps to it. In the first step, which is what happened originally, but it's kind of rare now, the third 3G carrier of UARFCN 10736 was cleared and then refarmed to 4G to produce the EARFCN of 372. However, more commonly nowadays, the refarm jumps straight to 10 MHz, clearing UARFCNs 10712 and 10736 to produce the EARFCN of 347 with a 10 MHz downlink bandwidth. And then the final step is to refarm the entirety of the 2100 MHz, which therefore removes 10687 alongside 10712 and 10736, providing the full size carrier of EARFCN 323. This is the first site whose cabinets we're going to be looking inside of. It's a dual stack Hutchinson Jupiter Streetworks pole with a pair of Ericsson RBS 6102 cabinets with all of the bays filled. As you can see from the pictures here, I caught it at heading towards sundown just by accident landing into the area at the right place at the right time. So now if we look inside the cabinets in this view, the radio units are visible and on the left cabinet there are the 800 MHz and 900 MHz radio units and on the right is the cabinet with the two banks of 2100 MHz radio units. These are all RUS which means they're multi-radio access technology capable radio units, the S standing for multi-standard. They're all 1T2R which means that one port is transmit and receive and the other port on each radio unit is just receive and therefore to get 2T2R you therefore need two radio units. You will note in the case of the 2100 MHz that there are 12 radios split between the two banks. 12 divided by the three sectors means it's four radios per sector. And the reason for this is to ensure there is sufficient bandwidth for both Vodafone and O2 to 
use the entirety of their 2100 megahertz spectrum on this site. So it's still operating in 2T2R, but through having two sets of 2100 megahertz modules, and in fact two sets of really broadcast antennas for 2100 megahertz, they get the double the overall bandwidth capability of compared to just using a single set of modules. Starting with the low band cabinet for 800 and 900 megahertz, let's take a closer look at what makes this mask tick. So on the left is the 900 megahertz array with the radio units as before. Then on the left of them is the DUW, which is the digital unit for 3G. So that will be doing the 3G 900 megahertz for this mast. It's specifically called DUW, the W standing for WCDMA and the DU being digital unit. Below the radio units are the DUGs, which are digital units for GSM with the G standing for GSM there and these do the 2G on 900 megahertz. There will be two of them because of the number of 2G TRXs that this mast will be broadcasting because it's carrying 2G 900 megahertz for Vodafone and O2 using that spectrum that I spoke about earlier. Underneath the DUGs for 900 megahertz, there is also the SI or site integrated unit which is essentially kind of the router for the site. It takes the backhaul and then feeds it to provide all the different technologies on the site and to connect the site to the mobile operator's network. In the case of 800 megahertz, things are much more simple with a pair of baseband R503s connected up to the radio units. The baseband R503s are essentially multiplexers and demultiplexers. So they are relatively simple devices as I guess this technology goes perhaps. Next up I will talk about the second cabinet which houses the 2100 megahertz equipment. On the left I have the 2100 megahertz bay which is designated as being for O2 and on the right the one for Vodafone. Starting with the O2 designated 2100 megahertz bay to the left of the radio units is a DUW, which is for 3G only on the 2100 megahertz. And below the radios is a DUS, which you'll recognize from before, and the baseband R503. The DUS does quite a lot of things, so I'll speak a bit more about that when we get to the overall site schematic. And the baseband R503 is doing a fairly similar multiplexing, demultiplexing role as it was with just the 800. In the case of the Vodafone designated bay, things are fairly similar. There's a DUS and also a baseband R503. So you'll note that there's potentially sort of a functional unit forming here. Naturally, I drew a schematic to work out how all of the different basebands and digital units and so on all fit together. However, unless you're viewing this in 4K on a big screen, you probably won't have enough detail rendered in order to be able to make a great deal of sense of the diagram. So I've made a much more simple sort of functional level diagram showing what's connected to what. And from this you can see that it's not necessarily all as complicated as it may seem to be. The site integrated unit forms the kind of epicenter of things and that's because like I say it's effectively the site router and then the 900 megahertz is served by the DUGs and the DUW so we can kind of forget about the 900 megahertz and then for the 820 100 megahertz it's relatively straightforward so for the 2100 megahertz one bank of radio is a DUW but we can sort of semi forget that for for now if possible and then it becomes very simple so there's two DUS's and then from each DUS goes two baseband R503's so fundamentally for 4G on a bank of radios there is a DUS 
and a baseband R503. In the case of the 800MHz, it's got two baseband R503s, each one is fed separately off a DUS. And then each of those DUSs also has communication with another baseband R503, which then goes on to a bank of 2100MHz radios. From this, we can see that the functional unit for 4G on a band is the digital unit and a baseband R503 effectively, which does pretty much match with what you would expect with the baseband R503 effectively just doing multiplexing and demultiplexing. You need the digital unit to actually effectively produce the signal in some ways. The R503 is just being an interconnect in some ways. From this configuration, we can also see that the 900 megahertz is not in a 4G capable configuration at this point in time because it only has DUGs and a DUW. It doesn't have like a DUS or a DUL uh, before it. Since we've now seen the inside of the cabinets of the site I visited in some detail, I will now move on to talk about the site that Jake saw being upgraded which is more of a medium capacity build. It doesn't have two banks of radios for 2100 MHz. It's only got one. But other than that, it's not too different. It has an RBS6102 cabinet, which has the 800 and 900 MHz radios in it, much like the site I saw. But for the second cabinet, it has a converted Vulcan, which houses the single bank of 2100 MHz radios and then a whole variety of the other equipment. Almost all of the pictures from this point onwards were all taken by Jake. Just send your thanks to him for hovering about in the snow for quite a long period of time to try and get lots of pictures and monitor what was going on. I will go through this site in a fairly similar order to the last one. The low band RBS6102 cabinet with the 800-900 megahertz has a very similar radio bank layout to the site that I saw really. And in the Vulcan there is the 2100 megahertz radios in a kind of separate bay to house them alongside their basebands in the enclosure that was obviously intended for other equipment originally. The RUSO2s used for the 2100 megahertz here have 20 megahertz of OVW but what you have to remember is that's split between Vodafone and O2 and therefore they have 10 megahertz each and this then limits what Vodafone can deploy in terms of spectrum because of course they've got more than 10 megahertz of 2100 megahertz so that is the limitation of this setup and why it's designated as a lower capacity build than the last one. Once we begin to look in a bit more detail inside the low band Ericsson RBS6102, there are some quite notable differences compared to the site that I saw the insides of. So for the 900 MHz bay in this cabinet, there is just a baseband 5216. There is no DUGs, there's no DUW, there's just the baseband 5216 and that's that. In the case of the 800 megahertz though, it's very much the same with a pair of baseband R503s. Moving on to the Vulcan cabinet, things are also quite interesting in that it's really not like the site that I saw at all in some ways. So to the left of the radios is a baseband 5216 and then the DUS and underneath the radios there are a pair of baseband R503s and then on top of the radios there's various backhaul equipment so the backhaul router and the 21st century BT equipment. So let's see how all of this fits together. Once again I've drawn a full-on sort of line drawing of what the site looks like. Now with this one I'm not quite so sure because the fibres aren't labelled so far as I can see and the end layout ends up looking a little bit strange, although I have spent many, many hours working out lots of different possible configurations and seeing how they would fit together and haven't really found any of them to be anywhere near as conceivable as the one that I've come up with here. However, just be aware that I'm not as confident about this one as I, want, as I was about the site that I visited. 
But anyway, let's jump into the block diagram of this site. As with the site that I visited, the 800 MHz is fed off a pair of baseband R503s and the 2100 MHz has a pair of baseband R503s as well. Now, two of these baseband R503s, one from the 2100 MHz and one from the 800 MHz, each connect to a DUS. And then the remaining R503s, one from the 800 and one from the 2100, then connect to the main baseband 5216. Now, for the 900 megahertz, it has its own baseband 5216, which connects both to the main baseband 5216, as well as the DUS, which then provides connectivity to two R503s, one of which goes to the 2100 megahertz and one of which goes to the 800 megahertz. So the functional unit in some ways is pretty similar for at least the 2100 megahertz and the 800 megahertz in terms of having baseband R503s, which are then fed onto the fed to be the brain of, of that band. I think the baseband 5216 that feeds the 900 megahertz is in some ways acting as a middle person for connecting the DUS to the master baseband 5216, just due to sort of number of ports available or something like that. I couldn't really work out as such why they would do a layout like this, but like I say, I can't really see any other conceivable way that this could be laid out based on the little information that I've managed to find about all the hardware. Now a thing to note is that while the baseband R503 is multiplexing and demultiplexing and is effectively acting as a bit of an interchange, the baseband 5216 is a very sophisticated, fully featured high-end baseband that can, that has huge capabilities so it's just because they're both called baseband does not mean that they operate in the same way or just have the same feature set at all. The two street work sites that I've shown so far in the video did not have radio replacements. The work was focused around the baseband and digital units to upgrade them to 4G 2100 MHz. However, sites with remote radios mostly have been getting a swap to their remote radio units with the 2100 MHz refarm and usually this then enables 44R 2100 MHz as shown here where RIUS 12s have been upgraded to the Ericsson radio system most likely the radio 2212 or 2217 and this has then provided the 44R over what was originally just 3G on the 2100 MHz. But as part of the upgrade project, sites haven't just been getting upgraded to 4G on 2100 MHz, many have also been gaining 2600 MHz as well. Now this site has been swapped from RIUS 11s to Ericsson radio system, as much like in the previous example, except it hasn't just got radios for 2100 MHz, it's also got one for 2600 MHz. Now this site is 2T2R at the moment for 2100 and 2600 MHz, um, but still the performance was very good as you can see in the screenshots. Just as an ending to the video, I will just now put the video clips that Jake recorded of the streetwork site that he saw being upgraded um, just so maybe you can get a different different look at the hardware and maybe make your own ideas about how they might be laid up.
thanks for watching and I hope to see you on the next video.